Well, here's the information slide for the SOFI seminar series. Now, let me welcome everybody to today's SOFI seminar. I'm Andrew Patton, the organizer of the series. Uh, today, I'm very happy to be hosting Serena Ng from Columbia University in New York as our speaker. And her discussant today is Marcus Pelger from Stanford University in California. We'll follow the same format as in past weeks. We'll have 40 minutes for the speaker, 10 to 15 for the discussant, and then the remainder for questions from the audience. And if the questions spill over, we'll move to an informal session after the recording has, uh, has ended. If you have questions during the talk, you can either use the raise your hand feature, and then I'll call on you to ask your question uh, directly, or you can use the Q&A box uh, as an alternative. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Serena, so please take it away. Okay, can everybody see? Good? Yes, this, this looks All right. good. Thank you very much. Uh, it's good to see everybody. Uh, a spotlight your video for everyone would you like to join audio no later okay so um glad to be uh here and thanks andrew for inviting me um so today i'm going to talk about uh, factor-based uh imputation of uh missing data so uh missing data uh is almost part of um a routine in empirical work it arises for a variety of reasons sometimes it just comes from attrition in surveys. Sometimes it's just um, entry and exit of firms, mergers and acquisitions, dropouts, and sometimes it's just government releasing data at staggered uh, time intervals. So what we usually do in, uh, is to make statistical assumptions about the missing data mechanism, and then we have some uh, procedure to deal with um, uh, the missing data, and, and I will talk about, uh, a little bit about this uh, coming up. So more recently, missing data has generated a lot of um, attention in the context of Netflix challenge. And, and the missing data there um, are the uh, recommendations uh, of movies um, that were not uh, recorded um, in, the, in the Netflix um, database. And so in machine learning, there's been a lot of interest in the Netflix challenge. And there, they don't make statistical assumptions. They make a low rank uh, structure assumption. And under certain conditions, uh, we can recover this uh, low rank matrix or, or complete the matrix, so to speak. So um, uh, typically, whether we do the statistical approach or the machine learning approach, um, iteration is part of uh, the solution. Um, you, you, know, you start with some uh, initial guesses, you iterate, and you have, a, uh, you have a solution. But when you do iterative estimation, it's a little bit like doing feasible GLS. It's very hard to establish um, formal results. So, while we have many algorithms, um, a lot of it in the context of EM, um, they converge, but we don't have a lot of uh, formal results um, about the uh, properties of these estimates that we, uh, we compute. So what we do in this paper is we impose a structure, and the structure that we impose is, um, is a common factor structure. So in going through the common uh, factor model allows us to, uh, gives us an asymptotic framework to do some uh, as target. So instead of making assumptions about uh, the missing data mechanism, uh, we're going to make assumptions uh, through the factor model. So what I'm going to present to you are two algorithms. Uh, one is called TORY, um, which I'm just going to call TW, and the other is called TP um, or TOR project. Okay? And they are, um, are more convenient for different types of um, patterns of the, uh, of the data that I'll explain to you in a bit. So what I want to do is to impute XIT or the missing values in XIT by estimates of the common component, which I call C tilde um, IT. Okay. So what we'll show it, um, is that um, in spite of the missing data, the whole common component matrix, the common matrix C, uh, can be uh, consistently estimated. And we're going to give you the convergence rate. This T by N matrix has to, actually has four different convergence rates, depending on um, uh, whether you have missing data or not missing data in the sense to be made precise. And uh, we're going to have a, a complete distribution theory uh, for these uh, imputed values. And what's uh, neat about this approach is that um, we can get this distribution theory without any iteration. Okay? So I'm going to give you, uh, we, we had three applications. Um, uh, I'll quickly show you one that I'm going to try to impute uh, weekly estimates of the uh, uh, of F1, uh, the factor computed uh, from a large panel of data. And I'm going to give you also weekly estimates of um, uh, an uncertainty measure. Okay? 
And, and the weekly data here of interest is that there's strong uh, non, uh, non strictly uh, seasonality, not strictly periodic, uh, which makes direct computation of the weekly um, estimates uh, a little bit challenging. And this pro provides a kind of a backdoor way to do this. Um, the second example is portfolio mixed risk management, in which we have to estimate the covariance matrix uh, from missing returns data. And here, one imputation is actually not enough. So we're going to have to do double imputation. Okay. Uh, the third um, example, which I'm most surely won't have time to get to, um, is that when they treat potential outcome as missing data, so we can estimate all sorts of treatment effects, other treatment effects over time across individuals over the entire treatment sample, et cetera. Et cetera. Okay. So um, this work is based on uh, two papers, um, uh, both with uh, one with uh, Jushan um, uh, uh, and one with uh, Kahan uh, Jushan and um, and both are on uh, Kai. Okay. Uh, okay. So so in the next uh, thirty minutes, we're going to give you a quick uh, uh, setup of the factor model, and um, uh, the, the the focus will be on imputing. The levels of X um, using the two uh, procedures, uh, TW and TP. Um, and then we're going to talk about uh, imputing the covariance matrix uh, from incomplete um, data. Okay. So uh, the setup um, uh, is uh, we have data X, T by N. Okay, the, 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 um, the columns are the, are the units and the rows are the uh, time series observations. I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to compute uh, um, uh, singular value decomposition from the scaled matrix, which is x divided by square root nt. Okay, so the z are actually uh, mean zero uh, standard deviation one. Okay. So the x um, is assumed to have a common factor structure. F are the common factors. Uh, lambdas are the, the lambda matrix, is a n by r matrix of loadings. Um, e is the e is incredit error uh, uh, component. Okay. So there are common factors. Um, that we're going to use the method of asymptotic principal components and we're going to estimate the f and the lambda uh, uh, by singular value decomposition. Okay, so essentially um, f is estimated uh, using the right eigen, uh, left eigenvectors, and the lambdas are using, uh, estimated using the, uh, the, the, the right eigenvectors. Okay. So there are different ways to do normalization, but it, um, it's, uh, the normalization doesn't matter. So uh, we're going to as assume uh, some factor uh, assumptions um, on, on this uh, factor structure that we've been using uh, for a number of years. We're going to assume that there are strong uh, factors. Um, in particular, we're going to assume that the R by R uh, uh, covariance matrix of F and the R by R covariance matrix of lambda, these are all uh, uh, positive definite. Uh, we need some moment conditions on the F and on the lambda. Uh, we work with an approximate factor model, uh, meaning that um, I'm going to allow these uh, idiosyncratic errors to be mildly correlated across time and in the cross section, um, mildly in the sense that um, uh, it, um, it, uh, uh, it, uh, uh, instead of the, uh, uh, double sum, it has to be bounded just a single sum. And um, the f's and the lambdas, we also need some central limit uh, theorem in order to do uh, asymptotic theory. Um, and so these results and assumptions have been uh, used um, uh, uh, for, you know, for, for some time now. And the main result uh, important for this analysis are the results from uh, Chushan's paper, the 2003 paper, which is that um, the F at each T um, can be, uh, is root N consistent and asymptotically normal. The lambda i's for each i are root t consistent and asymptotically normal. Um, so we can only estimate f and lambda up to a rotation matrix um, um, h, okay, and these are i by r matrices, but we can uh, consistently uh, estimate uh, the common component, each i t element, at a rate of a minimum of uh, root n and root t. So these are results for complete data estimation, meaning that we assume um, all, the, all, all, the, all the observation t by n uh, matrix of X is uh, completely uh, so. Okay, so this is a quick. Okay. So what we are interested in is a case when some data are missing. Okay, so as a matter of notation, uh, which we don't use this notation much because, uh, as you see, we're going to reorganize all the data. 
We use XM, M stands for missing, O stands for observed. So we have data that either missing or observed and, and, and they are going to um, uh, 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 comprise of our uh, matrix X. Uh, that's an indicator matrix omega IT uh, that, is, um, that is one if X is observed and zero otherwise. Okay. So typically in statistical analysis, we make assumptions about the missing data mechanism. And um, uh, a couple uh, uh, ones that are uh, particularly common, and this is a gigantic literature um, in, in, in statistics. So MCR stands for uh, missing completely at random, uh, which means that the missing data, uh, this omega matrix, which, which indicates which observation are missing, just complete, does not depend on X, um, a, a slightly uh, less um, restrictive assumption is missing at random, so that um, it doesn't depend on the missing data. Okay? The missing, the missing values do not, uh, the positions of the missing values do not depend on the values of the, of the missing data. Sometimes it is appropriate for, econo uh, for economic analysis, sometimes it's not. So um, the researcher has to make uh, a judgment as to um, uh, when this becomes appropriate. So um, there has been some interest in um, using uh, missing data, the missing data framework to analyze uh, potential outcomes. So in, in a paper by uh, Susan Avery and Peter Imbens, uh, for example, they have um, explanation uh, for why in, uh, in potential outcomes framework, the missing uh, random assumption may not be uh, always appropriate. Um, so what do we do with missing uh, data? Well, the traditional uh, solutions is usually you amputate the data or you impute the data. So amputate literally means truncate some data so you can either remove the entire row, okay, or which is called list-wise, or you can remove the entire column, which is called uh, variable-wise, or you can just uh, replace, uh, get rid of all those um, I's and T's um, uh, 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 with some missing values. So either way, um, if you do an analysis using uh, the amputation uh, method, you lose uh, quite a number of uh, observations. Okay? So, so often you, and then just a balance panel, uh, which can be a very tiny fraction of the original data. So another uh, approach, um, uh, an alternative to imputation is you're going to do uh, amputation is going to imputate, in, impute the missing values. Okay? So in imputation, we usually need a model, or this can be a regression model. Um, in our case, we're going to use a factor model. So the technical setup is you have an EM algorithm and you iterate uh, till, till, till you uh, converge um, using some uh, conditional expectation uh, um, to compute um, the, the missing values. Okay. So um, usually when we get into iterative um, estimation, it's much more difficult to get the uh, uh, formal theoretical results. So, um, but we do get the converge estimates. Um, so uh, and you know, so usually we're quite happy with it. Um, in a in a factor uh, framework, even in the original diffusion index uh, paper by Stock and Watson, they actually have an EM algorithm that tells us how to impute um, uh, the missing values uh, when we estimate um, the factors. But, with, 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 um, but that framework is a little bit um, difficult to, to, um, to uh, derive the asymptotic theory. So in the machine learning, they derive a lot of algorithmic um, error bound. Um, so if you assume a low rank structure, um, they have all sorts of um, bounds that uh, usually in, uh, in the context of uh, norms for the entire matrix, but not entry by entry. So what we want to do is actually to get some more precise result um, um, uh, at the I and T level, not just the entire uh, matrix. Okay. So um, basically uh, in the, you know, what, what, what the algorithmic result uh, tells us is that if a, in a large N and large T environment, um, if you are, uh, are willing to assume a low end structure, you, you certain things can be covered. We kind of follow this, uh, this general uh, idea. So what we do is, um, you know, in, in, instead of a, gene, uh, of a low rank structure, we actually put more structure in this low rank structure, we impose a factor structure. So the idea of using factor um, structure to in base imputation, actually the idea has been around uh, for some time. The, 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 some of these, um, uh, they, they appear in a number of theses. These were all PhD theses done um, um, a while ago. Um, good ideas, um, and it, it you know, and there were proof concepts that worked, but there was not uh, was uh, incomplete uh, theory for it. 
So interestingly, in the last uh, two, three years or so, there were three of us that actually worked completely independently and all using the same uh, factor model, uh, using different setup, uh, different assumptions, and all trying to solve the same problem. So it's actually quite exciting. So three papers I just mentioned quickly. Uh, this uh, paper by Su and All, it already came out in JOE, and they are still missing at random. Okay. Uh, Sean and Pelga and Pel uh, Marcus will talk about it a little bit later. Um, um, they do reweighting. So Su um, also do reweighting, but they have to uh, make a, uh, they do missing at random, so they do as, um, uh, estimate this um, probability of missing and they weight this way. Marcus has a different way of doing reweighting. And instead of reweighting, we actually reorganize the data. So we don't have any uh, reweighting or, or iterated as, estimation as such. Okay. So uh, to motivate perhaps we can think about the two simplest cases, um, how we how we get to the um, setup that we do. Okay. So data don't usually show up so neat and tidy uh, that you know all the missing values are isolated in a block. Okay. So but supposing we can isolate the data okay, such that um, a block of data in the south uh, east uh, corner are missing. Okay, so uh, for example, to fix ideas, um, there may be uh, a, a block of data on uh, certain types of industrial production series. Uh, okay, so that um, uh, that are released at um, at a uh, at the same time by the government. Okay, so that's just a, a convenient block that they are uh, they come in and uh, become available. Uh, at the same time. So this is a very convenient uh, structure when the missing data are completely organized. Okay. Then there's a, a different type of pattern that is less structured, but still nonetheless as a pattern. And I like to think about this so-called reverse monotone missing pattern. I like to think of it as um, developing countries uh, lined up in the first NO series or NO for number of observed series. Okay. Then gradually um, these series, as we move towards the right, um, these are countries um, that are less developed. Okay, so you get um, these uh, uh, these uh, maybe uh, uh, Brazil, and then you get by the get to uh, here you get the even less developed countries. So so you have data that come in in a more staggered uh, fashion, but sufficiently uh, still sufficiently organized that you can um, you can take advantage of this pattern. Okay? So so what we want to think about the problem is imagine that we can organize that data in this uh, generic way, okay? So what is this generic way? Um, that um, we can think of the data as four blocks, okay? There's a balanced block, okay? In which all the Ns and the Ts are, are observed in this, in this, in this block, uh, the, the one in the darkest uh, color, okay? And then below it um, uh, uh, is this four, four uh, uh, a balanced block and the tall block actually comprise this is together, called, it's called a tall block. The tall block means that all the data, we have data for all the uh, one through cap T for these uh, number of observations, which we call NO, okay? Now there's a wide block, okay, for which we have data for all of the N series, but over a shorter sample, okay? Which is this, uh, this wide plus this bell, okay? And everything else goes into this uh, missing data, missing block. So as, as written, this missing data block actually is not entirely missing. There are observations inside okay, that we that are observable. So what defines this missing data block as I drew it is actually the outer perimeter okay, of, of all the uh, observations uh, of all the variables that have at least some variables missing. Okay? So, so, so the main idea is really quite um, easily summarized uh, from this picture. Okay? So if I can organize the data into this way, these uh, four blocks, okay? And I cannot always do so, okay? Um, but supposing that I can do so, um, I know that I can estimate all the factors, okay? And assuming that each block has a share the same factor structure, okay? So if I can estimate the factors from the top block, okay? I already get all the x. If I can estimate the lambdas from the y block, I get all the lambdas. So if I have all the x, all the lambdas, I should be able to fill in the values in the missing block. And that's, in a nutshell, is really the idea, okay? Now, of course, everything depends on how I, you know, the size of the tall, okay? If my tall block actually only has two series with tall block, that's not gonna work very well. And likewise, if my wide block 
is wide, but it's very thin, like narrow, with only like a handful of series that has a handful of time series observations for which I have all day or all, all, all units observable. That's all not going, also going to work. Right? But so the presumption here is that because I, as a uh, researcher, know the dimension of the NO, which is number of uh, uh, units for which I have uh, complete uh, uh, unit, uh, uh, complete um, this, this block, okay, uh, for which I have um, uh, uh, all, all, very, all T observations observed. And, um, and I have TO, which is the number of time periods for which I have uh, all, to, all uh, N units observed. Um, I know what is NO, I know what is TO, so I should be able to make a judgment as to uh, whether this framework is appropriate or not. Okay. So um, now, okay, so, that, so, so that's the goal. So the goal is to first uh, estimate the factors here and somehow uh, fill in uh, the, the, the missing values. Okay. So, so why do I have two algorithms? Well, it depends on the pattern. Okay. If the pattern is, um, uh, very structured, okay. So, like the like the um, the block missing everything. Uh, the missing values are all concentrated in the south east corner that I showed you earlier. Um, um, the missing pattern is what I call homogeneous. Then we can use what's called T Y, okay, which is to estimate the f from the tall, lambda from the y, okay, which is why it's called T W. Okay. Otherwise, we we can um, we can uh, if if the missing pattern is a little bit heterogeneous, then I, I'm going to propose for you a different algorithm that called T. TP that we still estimate the factors from the tor, but we can do something else to estimate the lambdas. Okay, but the uh, but the bottom line is that just by doing uh, two principles components, we can actually get all the f's, all the lambdas. And the question is, how do you use f, f and the lambdas to to fill in the uh, values in the missing block? Okay, so there's no iteration involved. Okay, um, and and actually because the f's and the lambdas will be consistent as under the assumptions of the analysis that they size of the, um, uh, the tall block, uh, um, NO is sufficiently large and TO is sufficiently large, I'm going to get consistent estimates by just by doing two simple principal components. However, what I'm going to also argue that there is something to be gained in just doing one re-estimation. Okay? Because now, I've, once I've filled in all the missing values, I can do better than I've talked about by doing one more round of principal components using the completed matrix, which is excluded. And I'll show you that there's something to be gained. So, so um, the basic argument here is that, as I mentioned just now, I can do single value decomposition and estimate all the factors uh, from the tall block and the F, F tall, lambda tall. I'm going to also use uh, singular value decomposition as estimate the lambdas from the Y block and the F Y lambda Y, right? And um, I know I can get my uh, consistent estimate the common component in the tall and the Y block um, respectively, okay? But um, as uh, in the summary of uh, the overview of the factor analysis, we can only estimate only F and lambda only up to its rotation. Okay? So therefore, if I estimate the tall block, I'm the rotating, I'll be rotating the factors using one matrix. If I estimate from the Y block, I'm going to be estimating the factors using a um, rotating to a different matrix. So I need to get uh, the, these F and the lambdas, which are rotated to different um, according to different uh, rotation matrices, I need them to communicate with each other, okay? So to do so, I basically do a regression um, of some sub matrix of one of the uh, lambdas onto the other lambdas to make sure that they can move, okay? So that's just a simple regression, um, regressing the uh, sub block of the tor on, on, on the Y, and, and we, we, we show that um, actually uh, these, uh, we're gonna get the right rotation, uh, uh, this rotation matrix is going to call H miss for the, that rotates uh, the tall and the Y towards this uh, missing uh, matrix miss. So when we do these uh, two principal components from the tall block from the Y block and estimate them uh, the appropriate um, rotation matrix, we can do the uh, uh, imputation. The imputation is if X is observed, keep X. If X is not observed, replace it by the estimated common component, which is CIT. Okay, which come, which depends on both the F tall, the lambda Y, and this uh, and this rotation matrix, and that's it. Okay, so um, so we of course need some more assumptions before we can uh, make statistical statements, and uh, we need to have, uh, as mentioned uh, earlier, we need to have enough observations in the uh, in the narrow block. We need to have enough observations in the wide block, and this I think of it as an order condition. Okay, 
So we also need the factors to be strong, not just in the entire matrix, but also in the subblocks. Okay? Additionally, we also need some kind of block stationarity assumption okay? that, the, that the factor structure is actually the same across blocks. Okay? So these are, these are not um, uh, 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 arbitrary assumptions, and the user has to defend these assumptions. Okay? Now, um, more on assumption B, uh, assumption B is the size of these blocks. Okay? So um, as I mentioned, um, it is not the case that we can always arrange the data into this tall and wide, okay? um, and that may be cases when it fails. Okay? So if, for example, I may have, uh, I, I may have uh, some units for which I don't have complete observations of, uh, I don't have any time switch observation for the unit, but we can create something out of nothing. Okay? So we have to put uh, assumptions and there are um, just uh, uh, examples in which uh, assumption B will fail, but this, it, it, this is now, um, you know, the, the researchers are responsibility to go and defend these assumptions. But, um, you know, but if you can defend these assumptions, we can give you some theoretical result. And the theoretical result is that um, the, um, the, the common component um, estimated from X, um, every entry is actually consistently um, estimated. And, but there are four different convergence rates, depending where you're in the tall block, the wide block, the balanced block, or the missing block. Okay. And um, the slowest rate is, of course, the missing block. And the, and the rate is actually minimum of the sample size of n number of uh, 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 NO and TO. It's a mouthful to explain what is NO and TO. I hope you, you know what I'm saying. Okay. Now, for the balance block, because it overlaps with the tall and wide, so that two possible convergence rate depends, again, depends on NO and TO. Okay. We can, however, do better um, by uh, taking the imputed values um, estimated from the first round and just do one more estimation of principal components. And, and what we gain from doing this one estimation of uh, re-estimation is that um, the, the balance block can now um, be estimated at the rate of minimum of root n and root t as though um, the entire x matrix is observed. Okay, so re-estimation actually accelerates the convergence rate of not every block, but the entries inside the missing block. Okay, so um, so that in a nutshell is tall, tall wide. Okay, so you know, but as you can see, um, there are uh, observed values inside this missing uh, missing data matrix. Okay, and we will be using uh, all the information available, so we can do better. And what we can do better, the way we're going to do better is we're going to still estimate the factors from the tall block. Okay. But um, we're going to have, um, instead of estimating the lambdas as, like, uh, as a joint um, uh, principal components estimation, we're going to do projections, right, one by one, column by column. Okay? Basically, we regress the observed on, on the x. Now, because now we have to estimate all the x, we we'll just estimate the lambdas. So it is as though every series has, has a series specific uh, sample size. Okay? One of doing, uh, do estimate the lambdas one series at a time. Um, instead of as a, as a big block. Okay? But the convergence rate um, now is also um, series specific because now the sample size is series specific, but we can still estimate the, uh, the common component of this matrix. Um, so this is a more flexible um, approach, which is really ideally very suited for something like this. Okay? So we would, you know, for example, uh, take the uh, observations, the time series observations uh, for this guy and estimate the lambdas using this many observations Whereas for this, this last column, we will only have four observations to estimate uh, the lambdas for the last column. Okay? So, so we don't have to force, uh, force every, every series in the missing block um, uh, to have uh, the same number, uh, to use the same number of time series observations. So this again is a application specific thing. Okay? So I'm just going to give you a quick um, application of how, how we want to do this. Okay? So, so I want to, uh, you know, now there are more weekly high frequency data available. So if I want to estimate a weekly economic index from say a handful of economic variables, so let's say we have 20, okay? So to try to build an index from ground up with weekly data is quite messy because weekly data has very strong seasonality. And in this case, the data we have uh, includes some fuel sales, electricity output, and those are just strongly seasonal, a strong seasonality. So what we do then is you know, block the data this way. Okay, so um, assign a, a month in the week. So you see that sometimes there are five weeks in the, in, 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 the, in the month, sometimes there are four. It's just, that's what I mean by the data not being very regular. 
So instead, we're going to assume that the monthly, we observe the monthly F1, we can estimate it from the monthly data. We're going to assign the uh, monthly data to a particular week. In this case, in my example here, is I assign it to week one. And that means that I have uh, three, three missing values, or sometimes four missing values every month. I'm going to fill in these missing values. Okay. So what I get is something like this. Okay, so the, so the, the, the blue one is the monthly uh, 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 F1 that I get from my 134 data from uh, series from Fred MD. And the red dots are the ones that I, I impute using this uh, technique. Um, and you know, and you see that as expected, the monthly, uh, the weekly index is uh, is more uh, volatile than, than the monthly index because the monthly index is an average over the weeks. So, for example, this one is kind of interesting. This is um, this is um, 9 11. Okay? So, if you look at the weekly data, you know there is um, there is larger drop and, and new economic activity than what the monthly index would uh, show you. And likewise. If you look at um, this is the uh, JLN uncertainty index. Right? So um, again, you know, if you look at 9/11 uh, again, that, um, that, that the, the, the monthly uh, uncertainty tends to be um, smoother as expected. But there are interesting observations uh, coming from, for example, this would be um, the Lehman uh, the Lehman um, events, and this is 9/11. So you know, um, so it's a it's a um, it's a simple way um, to uh, Get at uh, get some uh, weekly uh, estimate. Okay, so so uh, in the remaining six minutes, I'm going to uh, go from imputing the data in level form. I'm going to talk about uh, imputing data, uh, the cover uh, trying um, attempt to estimate covariances uh, from missing data. Okay, so so the issue is so to, so let's motivate with just thinking about regression. If I regress y on some w, okay, and w on some missing value. Okay, so so what would happen? Well, if the W happened to be one of the factors, and this would be a factor of mental regression, this is actually okay, okay because um, we can consistently estimate the F2 uh, from the tall matrix. So my F is actually uh, consistently estimable. So if, if um, you know, so so uh, in this case, the missing value is, does not create a problem. What creates a problem is if W is an observable and there are missing values, and this is a well-known uh, problem. And the reason is that what we have done in, in uh, when we include the missing values is that we have replaced the uh, XIT that is missing with the conditional expectation, which means that we have shut down the idiosyncratic error. So which means that um, the variation of the regressor uh, is smaller than it should be because we have we have a uh, we have plugged in a zero instead of some random term. Okay? So there are all sorts of uh, ways to uh, to fix this uh, problem, and um, uh, in the empirical literature, it's usually done by some reweighting. Okay, uh, uh, you should either by the sample size or simply compute the uh, covariance matrix of X uh, using only those observations that are observed. Okay, so this. This is a generic problem that is going to carry over to covariance estimation. Okay. In covariance estimation, the problem is that, well, if X is observed, that's not a problem because it has an, an, an error term. But if X was not observed, we replace X uh, by X tilde, and X tilde uh, uh, is actually the estimated common component without this idiosyncratic error. Okay. So this becomes a problem if you, if you rely on this covariance matrix, such as if you do the covariance estimation. Um, using PSID data, for example, or you know, for this graph, we have also in portfolio and risk management when you have to do with the sigma x. Okay? You, you may have missing values coming from um, entries and exits of firms. Okay? And additionally, there is a problem that if x is high dimension, sigma x is not well um, estimated, often not well estimated. So in this context, um, sometimes we can do better by instead of estimating uh, the sample covariance, we can actually uh, replace it by the sum of the covariance of the common component uh, plus the idiosyncratic error, and um, sometimes that's also been used. Okay? So the problem we want to solve now is that while we, well, the TP and TW gives us um, uh, allows us to impute the level of X, we need a little bit more work before we can um, estimate the covariance from uh, from uh, from the missing data. So the the idea here is to do a second imputation. Okay, and we call this residual overlay. And the idea is basically just to inject some noise back into, um, the, uh, uh, into the included data. Okay. So, um, so we're gonna uh, work with four set resampling scheme. Um, 
Okay, so basically the idea is um, uh, uh, we take the estimated is in syncretic errors based on observed data and sample from that data, from, sample from that set of uh, it is incredible noise. Okay, so once we add back a, a noise um, to the imputed value, um, our our imputed data now has a little bit no, more noise than than uh, than we we, we uh, that we get out from doing TP and TW. Okay, so so basically it is um, a resampling uh, scheme adds back some noise. Um, so this differs from multiple imputation uh, that is using regression. The multiple imputation, what you do is you add back some noise, and every time you add back a noise, you get an estimate, okay? And you average the estimates from, from the different um, uh, resamples, samples. Okay? What we do is we actually uh, uh, compute different um, Xs from resample. We average over the sigma X before we do any um, uh, uh, risk management, management type um, calculations. Okay? So the four resampling schemes we consider Basically, um, either we collect all the er uh, estimated errors that we observe and sample from the pool, or we, est uh, we, we only sample from, uh, from the errors co corresponding to the, to the uh, series I when we try to resample series I. So it's either pooling or not pooling, and either parametric or non-parametric. Okay? So if it is parametric, we just do normal. Um, you know, and again, it's based on pooling or not pooling. Okay? So I'm running out of time. So. Um, so, so uh, we apply this uh, consider, uh, apply this to uh, uh, do a uh, look at some uh, risk measures and their portfolio volatility, uh, value at risk, uh, some core options, uh, uh, prices, and just simple variances and covariance calculations. Um, so uh, there are four resampling schemes. The zero is the one that doesn't do any imputation. So these are straight out of TP and TW. Anything with a plus means we do one round of estimation. And we also have some results um, that use this, um, uh, 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 they take advantage of the low rank uh, structure to compute the covariance matrix um, by summing the variance of the common component and the integrated component instead of using the covariance matrix. Okay. So there are two sets of Monte Carlo. One's generate data from strict factor model. One is a calibrated uh, Monte Carlo calibrated the SP 500 with N and T about 350, about same size, five factors explaining about 0.4 of the variations in the data. Okay. And here, what you see is that if we do nothing, okay, which is to take the data from TP and TW, okay, those are the two gray lines. They, uh, these are relative mean squared, uh, mean squared error. They get errors that are significantly larger than these other schemes that uh, we do um, uh, uh, the residual overlay. Okay. So some, sometimes they, um, the difference is non trivial. So this uh, table, for example, is based on of uh, 30% missing data, this is for strict factor structure. So in this example, they, the procedure that works best is TP plus four, which means we re-estimate and we then use um, uh, the series specific uh, sample. Right? The D here is the one that based on uh, the various covariance matrix of the common component and the synthetic component. Um, it's a significant improvement over doing nothing, uh, but you can actually do better. Right? So uh, the next table, uh, works with um, uh, 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 have a more heterogeneous uh, missing data pattern, but pretty pretty similar type. Right? So this is still a strict factor model. The TP plus four still comes out uh, best and significantly better than doing nothing. Then we took a uh, CRIPS data um, <clears throat> again based on thirty percent missing. Now with the CRIPS data, it is no longer as, uh, the case that the idiosyncratic errors are necessarily. Um, uh, 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 mutually uncorrelated across I, that can be cross-section correlation. Um, so uh, here, you know, so in this case, TP plus four still comes out pretty good, okay? Um, here, you know, the difference is not very big, um, but, uh, but it is still, um, the improvement is not quite as drastic as in the strict factor case, but it, the improvement over uh, doing nothing is still uh, quite, Quite significant, regardless of the performance measure uh, that we use. So the T plus four again is we estimate and we sample from the non-missing data only for series R. Don't pull. Okay. Um, now, because this is you know based on uh, uh, these are based on I think a thousand uh, Monte Carlo's. Okay. So um, it's it's, a, it's certainly uh, quite I think quite convincing that uh, we need the double imputation. Uh, but you know um, whether whether uh, we we cannot get a whole lot of um, 
theoretical result about optimality of this procedure because this is um, multiple estimation and then there's some resampling device and it becomes uh, over the top of the hip uh, to careful. So just, uh, you know, just quickly, this is program evaluation. Um, you can think about potential outcomes um, as a missing block and what is missing is the outcomes of the tree that have been not been treated. Okay, so um, that we have some results for other treatment effects. Um, so just to uh, summarize, uh, so what we what we try to do in this paper is to exploit the factor structure to impute uh, missing values. Um, so there are many applications um, uh, in surveys, especially whether you do micro site application, uh, uh, um, PSID, uh, health and retirement survey, uh, corporations, um, there are all sorts of um, missing values, and I think this can be uh, quite useful. So there, there remains a lot of implementation issues that need to be understood. Um, it, we have not um, uh, the mean and standardized the data because when you have missing values, it's not clear how to calculate the mean and standard deviation anymore. Uh, so we leave this uh, open for uh, future research. So I do want to point out that um, what we have is a framework, but it's not to say that you know we, we some the researcher still has to make a judgment whether NOTO is too small uh, to be uh, to 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 justify uh, using this uh, sort of methodology. Um, uh, so I think I will leave, uh, stop now and let uh, Marcus uh, take it over. Okay. Well, thanks very much, Serena. That was that was great, and you're right on time. So now I'll uh, we'll turn it straight over to Marcus. Okay. So thank you very much for the opportunity to discuss this great paper. Um, as Serena pointed out, it's based on two papers, and I would like to focus mainly on the 2021 paper. And Serena, would you mind muting? Oh, thank you. Um, so the problem that is tackled here is uh, the case of missing entries in a large dimensional panel data set. And the solution that is proposed is to impute missing values using a latent factor model structure. And the method that is developed here is essentially generalization of principal component type estimators in the presence of missing data. And the solution that's proposed is a simple and easy to use estimator for a latent factor model that can work under general missing patterns. And what is very important is that uh, makes it stand out relative to the machine learning literature matrix completion is inferential theory. So these two papers can provide the inferential theory for the latent factor model and imputed values under a general approximate factor model. And what is very nice about these estimators is that they leverage the specific structure of the missing patterns. And I will argue that this makes them optimal for specific cases. So the contributions that I think are the most important is the inferential theory part, in particular for a re-estimated PCA estimator. Um, the toll project estimator has very nice properties. And I think the variance, uh, the covariance matrix estimation is a very promising extension. So I just want to highlight this is a very creative, ambitious paper, and it will for sure be a very influential paper. I very highly recommend you read it. And I think that the re-estimated toll project estimator will become one of the benchmark methods in this field. So let me just quickly summarize the model again. So we have the standard uh, approximate factor model setup. So that means we have a panel N by T. We only observe X. We assume there's a latent factor model. That means we have some loadings lambda and some factors and some errors. And we want to estimate everything on the right hand side. Now, under the typical approximate factor model assumptions, that means we have strong factors that explain a lot of co-movement in the data, and the errors are only weakly dependent. That means they can be diversified away. We can apply principal component analysis, and we get consistency and asymptotic normality. So these are the results that Joshua had derived in his 2003 paper. Now, what is important is that these estimators for the factor and loadings are only identified up to a rotation matrix, and that will become important. Now, what would we like an ideal estimator to look like in the case of missing data? So on the one hand, we would like to use all observed values and that should be reflected in a high convergence rate. So we want N or T to be as large as possible for a specific value. And the second property that we would like to have is to have a small asymptotic variance. That means the variance in the normal distribution should ideally be the same as if we have um, fully observed data. 
But now we have missing data. So here are examples of how, how missing data could look like. So the dark blue areas are the missing data uh, blocks and um, the white areas are the observed data points. And the previous literature has mainly focused on the problem of missing at, uh, data missing completely at random. And what is really nice about this paper is that they study the hard problem of complex missing patterns. For example, if one observation is missing, it stays missing forward. And this is very important. This paper focuses on a setup where there will be one large, tall observed block at the beginning after reordering the data. And then there can be a complex missing pattern afterwards. Now, there are many relevant empirical applications where you will observe this missing structure. Um, in the case of causal inference, you can model missing values as a counterfactual outcome. And so simultaneous or block stagger treatment designs would be modeled as these two patterns here on the left. When we have mixed frequency, let's say we have weekly and monthly observations, after reshuffling the data, it can also be reformulated as this block structure. And when we look at survey attrition or dropout at the end of a sample, again, we could get this kind of structure. And what is very nice about the paper, I want to emphasize again, it will leverage this block structure to get an estimator that has, in some sense, optimal properties for this missing data. So just to give you an overview, what are the kind of ideas that have been proposed in this literature to tackle the problem of estimating the um, latent factor model? So there are these building blocks. One is, I will call it block PCA, where you take a sub block with fully observed data and you apply principal component analysis to it and use the eigenvectors to estimate either factor or loadings. The second idea is a loading projection. Let's say you have some candidate estimator for the factors given. Then you run a regression using only the observed values to get the loadings. And the third idea is weighted PCA. And here we want to estimate the second moment matrix. But for each entry in this matrix, we only use all the observed entries that we can find. So that will mean each um, average is taken over a different number of units potentially. And all these building blocks have been used in these papers that came up uh, recently. So the tall white estimator by Serena uses block PCA to estimate factors and loadings. The tall project estimator uses block PCA to get the factors. And given those factors, it uses a loading projection to get the loadings. And the weighted PCA ID is used to estimate the factors in the first stage. And then given those factors, a loading projection is used to get the loadings. So what does this mean now for these example patterns that I've shown you before? So let's start with estimating the factors and the red areas indicate the amount of data that is used with these different estimators. So if we have a large tall block, block PCA will use that data in this block. And there's a very smart idea that comes with block PCA. It will pin down the rotation matrix of these latent factors to be the one of this large tall block. And that will be important because it will allow you to get an asymptotic variance that will be the same as if you would use all available data. So if you have one large tall block observed, block PCA is actually in this sense optimal. However, the trade-off is if the size of this block becomes very small, less observations are used and that can be reflected in a lower convergence rate potentially. Now weighted PCA will always use all observations that becomes more relevant if the block size is potentially small, but there's a price to pay. And that is because the data is reweighted. The weighted PCA is essentially many local rotation matrices and that will end, uh, this will add to a variance correction term. Now, so bottom line, if you have a large uh, tall block, block PCA is optimal in some sense. Now, how do we estimate the loadings? So, here, the green area shows the data that is used for loading estimation. If you use block PCA, use the other dimension, this would be the cross-sectional dimension, and you have the same type of trade-off that as long as the block is large, it's great to use it when the block becomes smaller, you're not using all the data. The loading projection has the advantage, it will always use all the data. Um, and what is really nice about it is it will not add or it will not lead to additional variance correction terms um, because it takes the rotation of the latent factors given by the first stage estimator. Um, so in, 
the tall project estimator that Serena has presented is really nice because it uh, takes advantage of the block PCA and the loading projection to uh, use all the data. Now, we are not done yet. We can actually improve it even further. So Serena has presented a re-estimation ID. So here, once we have estimated our common components and factor model with a tall project estimator, we can use this imputed matrix and apply a conventional principal component estimator to it, and then update the missing values with these new common components. Now, this will use all observed data, and that will result in a potentially faster convergence rate and you will actually have the fastest possible convergence rate for this balanced subblock. Now, I really like this result, and I think it's very important, this result, because the literature already assumes that re-estimation will improve estim um, the properties of an estimation, but it's important to show it. And this paper shows the asymptotic theory of this re-estimation. And one important result is that the variance of the loadings will not have additional variance correction terms when you do the re-estimation. So you will get a higher rate without having to pay the price of additional correction terms. The variance of the factors will have these correction terms because this multiple local rotation matrix issue can arise here. But bottom line, re-estimation can improve the initial estimator and is a really nice result. So let me make some comments. Um, so I think that some of the results are actually even more general than presented in this paper. Um, the re-estimation approach, that means applying PCA to a, to a matrix where data has already been imputed, can be viewed as its own estimation approach. So this paper shows that if you estimate um, um, latent factors in the first stage, and this estimate with a specific form, and then you do a loading projection, then you do this re-estimation, then you have all these nice properties, like using all the data consistency and um, the inferential theory. And I think this kind of results can be extended to any estimator that has this type of structure to begin with. Even when you use this weighted PCA estimator, which has a similar structure, but can have an additional term due to this, uh, the difference between these local rotation matrices, um, I think that term can disappear when you do re-estimation and the tools from this paper can be used to show it. Um, so my suggestion for future research is to think further along the lines of what are the basic conditions for this first stage estimator and then apply re-estimation um, to get a better estimator. Another comment I would like to make um, has to do with uh, the discussion of assumptions. Um, one assumption uh, assumes that the second moment of the factors are the same independently over which data they are sampled and similar type of assumption for the central limit theorem. Now, this is not just a stationarity assumption of the factors, but it's an implicit constraint on the missing pattern. It essentially means that the missing pattern cannot depend on the time series. Um, it can, however, depend on the loading structure. Now, I think the paper would benefit and it would also help apply to researchers if these discussions would be, if these assumptions would be more discussed and what the implications mean. Because in the context of causal inference, um, it means that treatment cannot depend on the time series of outcome variables. So essentially there are no unobserved confounders. Um, when we think about stock return imputation, when we have a recession, this can lead to more missing values because there might be more bankruptcies. But on the same, at the same time, in a recession, the factors might have more negative values or higher volatility. But this would essentially be ruled out under this assumption. Um, so just to be clear, it is totally fine to assume this assumption and the other papers do it as well. I just think it would be beneficial to discuss what the implications are. And it would, of course, be great if this assumption could be relaxed. Um, I have some minor comments. Um, I understand that the empirical stock return study is an illustration. In case you would like to uh, build it up and add more, make it a larger part of the paper, I have some suggestions. So first, um, how good is the factor model on the empirical stock return data to start with? Um, because most of the results that you present um, combine the errors that you get from estimating a factor model and then estimating these factors using um, a partially observed panel. So I think it would be nice to see the results from estimating the factors using the full data 
so that we can see what is the effect of, the, um, of estimating the factors from the missing data. Um, another question that I have is how do the results depend on the number of factors? There's also evidence that individual stock returns have a time varying factor structure. The way how you estimate the factors, you use primarily data from the first part of the data. And um, so I'm just wondering how much the time variation can affect the imputation in the second half of the data. And maybe a rolling window approach can provide some additional insights. Um, as a last very minor point, I just want to highlight a bigger picture question here in this context. Um, when practitioners use stock return imputation, they use some algorithm to get a full panel. Then they might um, split the panel into a first half, a training data set to estimate weights for some kind of um, investment um, a strategy, and then evaluate it out of sample on the second part. But that won't be a real out of sample analysis because the data imputation uses all the data, which can create a look ahead bias. So I just want to point out there's a possible solution to this problem by a recent paper that uses Bayesian imputation with optimal log ahead bias and variance trade off. Um, a minor point about the covariance estimation. So I think it's a very promising idea to think along these lines, and that's the first paper in this, uh, that does it in this context. Uh, one thing that I'm a little bit puzzled about is when you do covariance estimation with resampling, you're not taking advantage of the sparsity in the well, you estimate the covariance matrix for the full data with the standard sample covariance matrix estimator without taking into account the sparsity in the residual covariance matrix. And we know that in a large N large T setup, the standard sample covariance estimator can have issues. And it seems to work well in your case. I'm just wondering if you have some thoughts why it is. Um, obviously, it would be nice to have more theoretical results for the resampling approach. But it is a very hard problem, and that's certainly not necessary to publish this paper. Um, just very minor points. Um, the simulation, uh, well, the theoretical results that you have that I think are the most important are about confidence intervals. And it would be nice if the simulation would also include results about confidence intervals. Um, and last but not least, um, you didn't have a lot of time to talk about the causal inference application. Um, I think you can easily extend it to weighted treatment effects instead of just an average treatment effect. So you could test for um, um, a change in regression coefficients after treatment. So let me wrap up. This is a very novel creative idea to estimate a latent factor model and use it for data imputation. Just want to highlight, it's a very simple estimator, very easy to use, and I'm sure it will become one of the benchmark estimators in this field. Um, I think the re-estimated tall project estimator is really great in terms of the properties that it has. I like the promising extension of thinking about covariance estimation. And bottom line, it's a great and extremely interesting paper and please read it. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Marcus. Serena, would you like to respond to any of the comments or questions Marcus raised? Um, I do want to thank uh, Marcus for the very thoughtful and constructive comment. I also encourage everybody to read Marcus' paper. This is also very nice. Um, so uh, the one comment about covariance estimation and why we, I think we're, we're getting echo. Um, so uh, the, the comment about why, why, um, why we're doing okay, um, even though in a large NHT context, we should be um, estimating, uh, when one may think about estimating covariances, um, uh, imposing sparsity. Um, we have result. I don't have a good answer for that. I, I think it might be that we use five factors um, and that's um, more than enough. <laughs> so that there isn't a whole lot of, um, uh, 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 correlation left in the idiosyncratic errors, but we, you know, we we spend a lot of time uh, on uh, the, the the interest. I think it is the case that with simulations, you can design something in which it works, or you can also design something in which it doesn't. So in in in, in this case, we were expecting that, uh, for example, the the TP was significant will be significantly better than the TW because the missing pattern is completely arbitrary, but it wasn't. So TW actually worked as good as TP. I just didn't show the result because it looks extremely similar. And likewise, I thought that 
the diagonal imposing the diagonality that way of computing logical variance matrix would be better, but it wasn't obviously better. So there's something about the you know the, how we generate data. Certainly for the strong fact, strict factor model, it, there's you know I had expected the diagonal to do better. It didn't do a whole lot better. So, but it could be specific to you know to to to, to design of the experiment. But you know uh, there are too many ways to design experiment. I I'm, not, I'm a little bit hesitant in running a horse race on. I don't know what I'm chasing after. <laughs> So, but um, um, in any case, uh, thank you very much for your comments. Greatly appreciate it. All right, thanks very much, Serena. Well, I think given the the time, maybe we'll take uh, questions from the audience in the informal session. So we'll we'll uh, we'll move to that session now. But before we go, uh, please let me do a brief advertisement for the next Sophie seminar. The next Sophie seminar will be in two weeks' time. Uh, on May 17th, the speaker will be Fusaini Chabi Yeo from uh, UMass at Amherst, and his discussion will be Lai Zhu from Syracuse University, and that'll be, uh, that'll be in two weeks' time, so please join us all then, and please stick around now for the informal session um, after the official recording ends. <laughs>